Okay. Hi, Richard. So, how are you today? Good. How are you doing, Loris? Uh, you gave a presentation yesterday at Handmade Conf, right? Uh, what yes. was it? Uh, so the title of the talk was uh, High Level Low Overhead Programming. So it's basically, mostly it's talk about Rock, but also I guess kind of some of the concepts sort of work with other languages, theoretically. And somebody else is making a high level language and wants it to run really fast. So how was the handmade crowd, I guess, right? They, care, they really care about speed. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, I mean, that was, that was kind of the thing that I was looking forward to about this conference, because I've talked about Rock at some other conferences before, but... Um, I, I didn't really feel that I could do a whole talk about like the really low level stuff, like talking about like, I mean, there's some like assembly, you know, in the talk. Um, and I think if I give that at most conferences, people will just be like, what are you talking about? But it, for this crowd, it was cool to be able to like get down at that like really low level and um, not have to worry about like spending a lot of time like sort of setting up backstory and stuff. So yeah, that was, that was cool. Uh, if I understand, you're using Zig, right? Somewhere in Rock. Yeah, yeah. So the whole Rock standard library is written in Zig. Um, the compiler is written in Rust, but the standard library is written in Zig. So whenever you run a Rock program, uh, you're running code that was like generated by Zig at some point. Rock is not exactly public, right? And the handmade community also has experience with another project and another programming language, which is not exactly public yet. But I believe there are some critical differences there, right? Sure. So, so the Rock repo, it's the repo is private, but anyone can access it. Also, if you go into the repo, like there is an open source license, so you can just like if you wanted to, if anyone wanted to, they could just like go into the repo and be like, "I'm open sourcing this," and that would be totally legal. Um, I, I hope nobody will do that because that'd be kind of a <laughs> jerk thing to do. But um, yeah. yeah. So the reason that the repo is private is basically just like I'm, I'm trying to set really clear expectations. Um, the term I've been using internally, like in, in like in conversations about this, is like I'm trying to hacker news proof it. I really don't want Rock to be on the front page of Hacker News like right now. I really want it to be just like let's work on it and make it good, and then like make a good first impression when it's like ready to be public. So 100% of people who've asked me for access to the repo, I just give it to them, no questions asked. So it's not like um, at all like a secret. Um, it's just that I'm trying to make a little bit of intentional friction so that um, anybody who is like participating is basically like has at least taken the, the very small step of like writing me an email saying, hey, can you add me? Um, and so basically, uh, so far, what that's meant is that um, we know like exactly how many people are like engaged enough to do that. So there's like about 250 people in the repo right now. Um, and of those, uh, I think 50 people have made commits, um, like like one or more commits. Um, and then of that, I think only like eight have uh, uh, like 100 plus commits. I think one of them is like 90 something, but yeah, about eight people. So um, it's really like uh, a very small like number of people who are actually trying it out. But um, because the repo is private, like I don't have to worry about someone being like, oh, let's put it on Hacker News. And then like, I, I've seen this happen where like even no matter how many disclaimers you put in the readme, like people will just evaluate it as as like, oh, this is like this is what this is what this project is. So uh, in addition to like whenever I talk about Rock, I'm very careful to say like it's a work in progress. Definitely, please don't go out and use this for anything real yet. But if you want to try it out, you know you can. So um, that's that's the reason. Do you want to talk about your IDE idea with plugins? Do you think it's oh sure yeah I can talk about that too. Um, so. A big part of Rock's goal is to not just be a, like, not just ship with a compiler, but also to ship with an editor. And so there's a thing that I really want to, like, like the, the goal, um, where, like, what we're trying to build towards is having an editor. Uh, the editor is like, it's an IDE, it's like Rock specific. It's like not designed to be a general purpose thing at all. But we really want to try and, like, advance the state of the art and just, like, try to make, like, the nicest editing experience possible for the language and like make this this really specific thing that like hopefully everyone will, will want to use. Even like I use Vim, you know, all the time. Like that was one of the things I was like, it has to be so nice that I have a revealed preference to not use Vim, but I will use this instead because it's so nice that I, I just couldn't bear to not use it. Um, so uh, that's the goal. But a big part of that is trying to explore this, what, what I see as a very underexplored space, which is integrating editor tooling with the package ecosystem. So the vision is, imagine you install a new package, and because you install that package into your project, not only do you get the source code, and not only do you get the documentation, which is kind of like status quo standard for you know most package systems, but also you get editor tooling that just comes with that package. That's like that 
specific to that package, like I mentioned, you get like a regular expression package that you install. Um, and it comes with like a little tool that you can use to like try out your regular expression, feed it some inputs, watch how it's like stepping through things, like what the capture groups are doing, like help you debug. Cause regular expressions are famously like, you know, write once, read never, <laughs> like in terms of like working with them. And I think having editor tooling that's like comes with the package would really help out with that. But right now in the modern editor ecosystem, it's really hard to do something like that because imagine you're like writing your rock regular expression package. What are you going to do? You're going to make like a Vim plugin and Vim script and like another like VS code plugin and like an Emacs plugin. Like there's just too many different editors that people use. So the hope is to get an editor that like everybody gets on board with um, and, and wants to develop these like plugins for it. Because in order for there to become a useful editor plugin ecosystem, you kind of need everyone to be on board with that. Um, so it can become a virtuous cycle if like ev everybody like buys into it and is like, oh, we're all using the same editor. So of course I'll make an editor plugin because it's like, obviously it's like, we'd also want to make it so that editor plugins are written in rock and are really easy to write. Um, but like assuming we're able to do that, then we can have an ecosystem that's like, from my perspective, like never really been done before, except like maybe in the small talk community is like arguably. Um, but like, that's like, the, I think the closest thing you would have, but um, like just, just trying to make it so that culturally like, writing an editor plugin is something like everybody does because it's so easy and you just like are so used to having that. I think like we've never seen what programming can be like if, if that's done. And in order to do that, I think it would be really hard to retrofit that onto an existing package ecosystem. So I want to try it in Rock in part because we don't have anything yet. So like we can try to set that expectation from like day one and try to get the cultural thing going. Um, small talk community is a good example of this, uh, where like they do have a big cultural value of like everyone uses the same editor. In small talk's case though, that's because in order to like edit small talk code, you have to use this, this, um, this editor because there's no like text file format. You can't edit a small talk um, image in Vim. Like your small talk code, it's like, a, it's a binary encoding. So like only the small talk IDE is capable of even like editing the source code. So we don't want to do that. Like I, I want rock code to just like work normally with GitHub and stuff like that. Um, so there is a textual file format. So yes, you can edit it in other editors if you want, but in order to realize this vision of like everyone's using the same editor, everyone's, you know, doing all the, the, the plugin stuff together. Um, it, there's like a really tricky incentives problem there because like right now the editor is like, you know, very bare bones. Like it doesn't do much yet. Um, it def certainly doesn't have a plugin system yet. And so if we were to like have a big explosion in rock users, a thing that I worry about is what if this happens? What if people are like, look, I know that you want to do this thing with the editor, but like, I just want to write my rock code right now with like the nicest user experience. So I'm just going to make a language server protocol thing. And like, I'm just going to set that up and then we'll just, everybody will use that. And then like, that'll just be like what becomes the normal thing that everyone uses. And then we come out with the editor with all the plugins and like, you know, it's like everybody's looking at it and being like, uh, yeah, but like, okay, there's like these little annoyances like about this. It's not as fully featured as like, you know, Vim and Emacs, whatever. And then, you know, the package ecosystem just develops without plugins. And then like, we've missed our window of opportunity to like set that cultural norm from the start. So this is another part of the reason that the repo is private is like, I want to rate limit the growth now while we don't have that editor plugin thing set up yet. And so that I can like sort of explain this to like community members and hopefully people will just get on board because they like buy into that vision and want to see it happen too. Um, so right now we just all like edit rock and like, you know, we just turn on like coffee script syntax highlighting, which randomly turns out to be like the closest, <laughs> um, and like, that's it. Um, and, and then we just, you know, run the, the command line compiler to get like the error messages and stuff. Um, so the hope is that um, like by the time that like the, I'm ready for the repo to go public, I, I want to already have like the, the seed of that um, like package ecosystem started where it's like we have some packages, they have the like built in editor tooling. And so people who are coming into the language, um, the editor, okay, it's still probably not going to be as fully featured as editors that have been around for like 10 plus years, fine. Um, but it'll have like all the syntax highlighting and, and like all the type checking and all that stuff will just be like perfectly integrated into it. It'll, that's kind of already is to some extent. Um, and also it'll have this, like these, these plugins that you can't get anywhere else. I'm like, you're going to miss out on that. If you, you know, if you're trying to like, be like, no, I, I want to use Emacs. I want to use Vim. And so the hope is that, um, because the gap between those will be so big, cause there won't be a language server protocol competing with this. And it's like, well, I could use Vim for this, but then I'd have to do this like janky copy script syntax highlighting thing. Or there's this whole editor right here. That's like got all these great features. Like, okay, fine. I'll, I'll try using something outside my normal editor. So trying to like give the editor the best chance of overcoming that inertia, you know, um, is, is basically like another part of the reason that the repo is private to try and like rate limit the growth now. Um, cause I mean, really, I don't know of any languages pulled this off before. So like, I, I was trying to think critically about like, 
what does the path look like where we're successful? What are the things that could like obviously derail this and make it so that we don't successfully set up that cultural thing, the, the virtuous cycle? Um, and one of the obvious ones was like, what if everybody just used the edit they're familiar with? Because that's what everybody does. That's like, the, <laughs> there's like such momentum there. So I don't know. We'll see if it works out. But like right now, it's 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 very nice. Like we have a very small, like pretty tight knit community of people who are just like, you know, bought into the like the language, like want to help, you know, see it grow. And like um, lots of people are working on lots of different things. And uh, yeah, it's just like uh, it's it's not as big as I'm sure it could be if we were a public repo. But I don't know for, for right now, like given the overall goals, it seems like the right trade off. Uh, I really liked it. Um, I definitely want to come back. It, uh, I was trying to think like, um, you know, for me, I, I, I really like low level programming, but I haven't done much of it until the past several years of my like time as a programmer. Um, professionally, I haven't really done any. Uh, and so when I was looking into like, how do I learn more about like low level performance optimization stuff? Um, like all the YouTube videos I was finding were from like CppCon. And then like maybe some from like Rust conferences, but like even like Rust conferences don't usually get into like these details that that often. Um, so it was great to just have a conference where it's like everybody's like into that. <laughs> um, like just everybody's like really like comfortable with like doing really low level stuff. Um, and that was really cool. Uh, there was a lot of like there were a lot of talks and like demos about game stuff, which um, is interesting to me, but, like just kind of casually because I, I don't really do any game programming, but it was like kind of cool to see. And and they make for really nice demos. So those are fun to watch. Um, but uh, but yeah, I mean, overall, I just like it's it feels cool to just like have a conference where it's it's not C++ specific because I don't use C++. Um, but but yet it's still about like low level stuff. And especially because like it is with uh, languages that I actually do use like Zig. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I, I really enjoyed it.